Well, hello. And welcome. To the Minimum Wage Podcast. We're even the name, name is, is above our pay grade. grade. Today we're joined by... Samuel Welsh. How y'all doing today? Doing excellent. How are you doing today? I am living life large, boys. Doing wonderful. I love to hear it. Yeah. Yes, so, Sam Welsh, uh, tell us your backstory, sir. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> That's a Oof. That is a loaded question. <laughs> that's a, that's a bad <laughs> Dalen. That is Quite a dude. loaded question. Hey, we got time. Usually you have to like lead with like a specific question, you know, but no. Just oh, back in my day, <laughs> I was no. born on <laughs> April 1st, 2000. Yes, give me a joke. I've heard it. I swear. I've been on this planet for 23 years. Oh, oh, oh you're an April Fool. <laughs> oh, no. Really? What gave it away? <laughs> um, now, nah, born and raised here in Augusta, boys. Um, uh, unlike y'all living out here on the south side, I was, uh, up there in the Columbia County. Mm. Uh, man, and the amount of times I've been down here in the community area just, uh, for basketball and all that type of shit, growing up, playing for the Augusta Eagles. I still think all throughout my high school career, we still have the winning record against yeah, y'all. I mean, there's no angels. doubt. Well, y'all probably actually practiced, too, so that's one thing. That is true. <laughs> we did. We would <laughs> practice all the damn time. <laughs> yeah, so the one thing about our teams is uh, we had very little practice ever going on. The only practice would be in the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> that's really all it was, dude. So we had just natural talent from kids that just loved basketball. Like, if you look at our soccer team, our soccer team was literally just conditioning for basketball season. Like, legitimately, <laughs> nobody really liked soccer. Like, they would like it enough to play it. But nobody was passionate about soccer, except for, like, maybe two people in the school, okay? Right. And those two people really weren't great at basketball. <laughs> so, Makes you know, sense. really, our school was a basketball school. Even though we did not practice, we still had incredible teams. And we went to state almost every year. I, w I will give you all that. Y'all just had, somehow, y'all were just this little pocket of random ass basketball talent <laughs> yeah and it made no sense Dude. when you looked at it on a map you're no, like not at all this place really <laughs> i don't know where cranking yeah. them out i think it all went back to the driveways dude oh yeah like legitimately <laughs> because these people like i had been playing ball with these boys since i was like probably five years old old enough to dribble a basketball dude because everyone that was what you did after school you'd go to somebody's driveway and you'd play basketball oh yeah that's just what it was at, in those days and now i think our back teams are probably day. not nearly as good back in the All old these covered wagon are, yeah, yeah, back, back in the dog on horse drawn carriage days oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah nowadays i think they're just playing Fortnite or whatever <laughs> 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 they ain't out there playing ball a little, so, little bit of Fortnite. little uh does anyone even actually play cod anymore i don't know yeah, um, I've heard the friends. New, I've heard the new one is like total sh ass. Is it? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't. I haven't played it. I <laughs> have no idea. You know, you can say you can say either of those words. Uh, yeah. shit, no, it's just <laughs> sh ass. Sh ass. Sh ass. Man, y'all are total sh ass over there. <laughs> I tell you what. Boy, I tell um, you what. <laughs> I don't particularly enjoy playing COD by myself, but I'll I'll play it with other people. I got you. But you're playing the old COD, right? Not the new one. No, I'm playing Modern Warfare the two, the new one. Oh, does any, does anybody so remember like the old COD lobby days, like the ones where shit just hit the fan? And the Xbox lobbies. Yes. 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 Lobbies, yeah, yeah. yes. Whereas like you were guaranteed to come out with a six pack for because of you're laughing so much. Mm -hmm. Either that, or if you were like um like y there was it was no holds barred back then. Oh yeah. Right. But nowadays you got all this like every now and again though. Oh. You can still get some good lobbies. Oh, really? It's not uh, so. It's it's a lot more common whenever a game like first comes out, uh, because the people on there are the people who wanna you know have some fun. Oh, um, it's not the sweaty tryhards. W once the game gets older, it's like no one talks in game chat really. I got you. Yeah, I got you. Because they're all, like, listening to music or something in the background, yeah. or they're talking to their friends in another party or whatever. Exactly. Or all of them, are, or everybody else is, like, on sh uh, Twitch or yeah. Kick now, yeah, streaming. Kick. What yeah. is Kick? Isn't there, like, a streaming platform called Kick now? No, Kick was, way know. back in the James. day, Kick was a messaging service. Um, I know about that. And now they have one, is it, like, K-I-C-K -K or something? I think so. Everything okay, because K-I-K back in the day, like... Oh, um, I'll like comment on my friend's post on Instagram every now and then. I'll say, "What's your kick?" Because <laughs> back in the day, like if you're trying to get digits, we had there, nobody had phones. Everyone had the iPod touches. Okay. Yeah. And with the iPod touch, you had kick. 
and that was like your messaging app, right? So that was like the pre-Snapchat, pre-Instagram DMing. Like it was just kick. And if you like somebody, you say, what's your kick? And so, yeah, if you see anybody, like any of my friends that post, chances are there's like one comment in like somewhere one of their down there, somewhere in their Instagram photos where I said, what's your kick? Do it right funny. now. Do it right now. Pull it up. Find a random Don't post. Okay, I got you. Find I got a you. random post. Well, I got to say that your oh, phone wait. is uh, yeah, recording. Yeah, I can't do that. I oh, can't okay. Do hold that. on. Hold on. Let's do it on mine. Let's do it on but mine. But you're not following all the people I follow. I May- guarantee maybe. you. I, f- I follow a couple uh, people. I am. I'm pretty sure. Uh. If we look at Josh, Josh Freed. Him, maybe not. I'm ta- I'm ta- I follow more like the old school uh, community folk that I played against. Like, I got Ben, Abe's in there pe- somewhere. So yeah. it's like, you, you can find them. I probably do not have one of those comments on theirs. But I'm talking about like the guys a little closer to my age range. Like the ones that I pretty much grew up with. You know, the ones that I know through and through. We were born in the, the same era, you know. Ooh, you're just bringing out eras. All right, all right. Shout out to Taylor Swift. Yo, speaking of which, what <laughs> what happened? What was going on that everything I've seen on in social? Me- yeah, all the social media posts I've seen about Taylor in Atlanta yelling at somebody in the middle of her. Uh, oh, concert are or you something? talking about the uh, the security guard? Yeah, what's going on? What yeah, happened? Yeah, so the... there was some girl or something that was like not even doing anything wrong. Like, she was just, like, jamming out, like, having a good time with Taylor. As you do. As you do. And the security guard came over to stop her. And Taylor saw that, and she's like, hey, quit, pretty much. Like, I saw the video. I don't remember what she said exactly, but it was, like, pretty minor. Um, And then the security guard got escorted out by other security (laughs) guards. (laughs) He got hit with the Uno reverse card right there. Pretty much, dude, yeah. He was just trying to ruin these folks' Um, fun, and Taylor was not having it. It says uh, disk not ejected properly, and looks like your SSD could have been ejected or potentially unplugged. So, yeah, that was actually an old message. I I did not delete it. Okay, okay. Yeah, because we're we're re-injected. The recording was actually stopped if it was not injected. Ah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. All all the stocks of injection and ejected. I don't like where your mind's going right now. (laughs) I I mean, you're uh, you're teeing the ball up. Like, you can see the brain wheels. You can see the brain wheels turning right now, can't you? (laughs) I know, and I don't like it. I don't (laughs) like it at all. (laughs) Even um, through those sunglasses, I can see the brain wheels turning. Hey, oh, yeah, that's a good segue right there. All right, that's that's a horrible (laughs) 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 segue. He literally just says artificial intelligence. That's less of a. Um, yeah, so of a hard cut. <laughs> yeah, really. So how we got to know each other was through what? You and me? Yeah. Dude, man, that that what I think it was at school, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. the honors program. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. So you went to the same university as John and I. Right, right. Um and Proud we were alumni. both in the honors program. Did you graduate from the honors program? I did not graduate from the honors program, and I got a bone to pick for uh, for this reason, let me hear it. Okay, so at our at my alma mater, where y'all go to school, yeah. um, to graduate with the honors program, you have to complete an undergraduate research thesis. Yes. Right, just to grad w- with honors. Yeah. Well, I got a degree in finance, bro. I'm a business major, so like an undergraduate research thesis means nothing mm-hmm. in the business world. Like right. there's there's no advantage to having one. Yeah. Because I got some friends that graduated from UGA with honors, but they didn't have to do a research thesis. You only have to reach a certain amount of out credit hours in honors coursework. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, why can't we do that? I mean, I would love to have on my resume and on my diploma graduated with honors, but I don't because I'm like, why would I waste the time on doing all this undergraduate research for a thesis when it means nothing in the field that I'm going yeah, into. Yeah, zero return on your investment, really. Exactly. Yeah, that's really weird. I think, honestly, they should make it optional. But What, I think what their all mindset, is needed to do honors? You just need the graduate or the undergraduate coursework for honors. There's like a certain level of credits you have to get. I think, was it, uh, I think in my when I was there, I think it was 30. Yeah, probably. You had to do 30 honors credit courses. So like, and what type of courses would those be? So... Initially, they're just the same classes that uh, your gen eds are. But yeah, they're, they're core classes. Right, your core cra- classes. I think you have to take uh, 12, of co- 12 hours worth of core, yeah. and then you have some what are called capstone courses, mm-hmm. and then you have to take, uh, was it 15 or 18 co- capstone cr- class cor- 
right. credits. And then throughout that capstone process, you are completing an undergraduate research project. Mm. And then, you I mean, you can present your research, which in certain fields, I think that's awesome. So, yeah. if, like, if you're going pre anything med ba- pre-med based or dental based or anything like that, man, that undergraduate research thesis and research that you pu- that ends up getting published that's that's awesome for you if you're going in that field that's like, great, it's yeah. it re- owned by the university but. that is true yeah. <laughs> and, but i mean which like, is why like if i did it you know if, if i wanted to invest in like doing a thesis it would it would be something that i would care about and probably want to monetize Right, right. So I mean, that's you know, your you th- you 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 feel entitled like that's your IP, right? right. You created it. Yeah. You want all the rights. But no, no, no. It's theirs. When it's you AUs. do it through, yeah, when you do it through the honors program at school at the they university, own that research. That's their research yeah. to own. So, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> another yet another reason why I was like, ah, uh, I got to my uh, g- the end of my j- my last the last semester of my junior year, and I was like. Well, the original reason I got into the honors program was for the priority registration. Yeah. So mm. as a freshman, you can get all, or a freshman sophomore, you can get all the good classes with the good professors. Are yes. uh, throwing it back to ratemyprofessor.com. You get on there <laughs> and you do so much research, yes. and you're reading all the comments and everything. I really don't even check these days. I'm just like, eh. I'll take that guy. That's, well, that's like, your mentality. It's like you know what? Well, it's like. This person's class has a decent amount of people in it pretty quick. Looks good enough. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I had to do that. So I actually would have been screwed a lot of times. So I had friends that were not in the honors program. They were just getting the classes that their advisors gave them. Right. And they had horrible experiences. And yeah. with all my core classes, all my easy like core classes, I would just get the best professor on right, my professor, and I would have an incredible time. Like the professors are always great. If you're looking at them on right, my professor, I would never pick one that's below a four. Oh, never. Four out of five. Yeah, never. And I would always get great professors. And I think that's really why my GPA is so stacked right now. Oh, for sure. Because I padded it out with those incredible professors early on. They made it easy for me to succeed. Well, and that's the other thing is like when I first started going to school, getting into college, like I, I, um, I got two, I got two older siblings that are like, uh, 10, uh, 12 and 14 years older than me. Damn. And I was talking to them. I was like, so what advice can you give me? And they were like, your first two years in college make the most, have the most academic impact to your GPA. Yeah. For sure, for sure, without a doubt. So what I did, I was like, all right, I'm going to take that, utilize Rate My Professor and the priority registration through the honors program, um, and then get the best professors that I know that I can work with. Yeah. And really just, like, stack that GPA like you're talking about. And, like, if you stack it your first two years, okay, you might you, – you'll have some wiggle wiggle room when you get to, like, your cor- your major work, yeah. right? And that's what ended up happening to me unless, again, you're in the business – I don't know if this is the same case for you, but in the business school, there's one class you have to take at your very last semester, and there's only one professor that teaches it. And, like, you can't understand the guy it, 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 at all <laughs> yeah. when he's talking. Like you can't understand a dang <laughs> word. Like I'm like I'm going what? into one of those in my next semester <laughs> coming oh, up in the no. fall. Yeah, oh, this girl oh, I took her once before. I got an A in her class. I was one of the only few A's. There you go. Because um, well, I had some uh, underhanded methods. But basically, oh. all I have to say is get to know your professor first of all. Like oh, hundred. They always will give you priority treatment, even though oh. even though like you know all of them are like you know. Uh, they act like they're so upstanding. Like, they'll never do under-the-table dealings or anything like that. Oh, never. college is nothing but under-the-table dealings, saying, man. Once you get that's in all there, it you is. Realize, and I think that's probably the best preparation for a career you can have. <laughs> exactly. Oh, definitely. <laughs> that's that's definitely. the real career preparation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for most sure. people don't get oh, it, really. and they're just sitting there with their Cs. They're like, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. These are my grades. Now, if you go talk to your professor, chances are they're willing to work with you. Oh, I got a perfect story that leads into that. Yeah. That just solidifies that entirely. Yeah, what's up? So, one of the, so, with a degree in, I got my degree in finance, and one of the courses that we had to take, initially before I got there, had an 87% attrition or fail rate in the class. Outside of, like, your OCHEM or your Selma Lec 2 type classes, it was Mm -hmm. the hardest course um, at us, at the undergraduate school campus, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, COVID had just started. 
So initially, all, the entire class was pen and paper. So all the tests were pen, paper, and a calculator. Yeah. Now, I went up to the professor because the professor had made it clear. She was like, well, if you present an argument and there's sound logic behind it, I'll agree with you and I'll make adjustments. So I went up to her at, towards the beginning, like I think it was after the first week, after syllabus week. Yeah. I went up to her and I was like, hey, Dr. Dr. Hobbegger, like I understand your concepts here. But you yourself have told us that your job is to pre prepare us for the real world and the working environment. We don't. Nobody uses pen, paper, and calculators anymore to do all these calculations. Everybody's either using specialized softwares or systems that are designed for it, or at the very least, using Excel. Yeah. So yeah. why can't we just have all of our exams and graded through use you use Excel? And she was like, "No, your logic makes sense. Okay." Spends the whole following week rewriting the entire class uh, and transitions all of it onto Excel instead of pen, paper, and calculator. Incredible. And I end up being the only A out. So we started the, the <laughs> semester with 32 students in that class. Yeah. By midterm, we were down to 16, uh, and I was the only A. And then two of the other guys that I did all, I helped them with everything, and we, we had our own study group. They were two of the only other three passing grades that semester. Wow. I get <gasps> three passing grades? Four, four total. Four, four total. total and, and two of them you worked with. Oh, yeah. Good <laughs> Lord. So Out I of 36? Yeah. That's I was, ridiculous. I was the only A, and then one of those guys had a B, and then the other two passing grades were Cs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Wow. And you made yourself known to the teacher. Oh, Most for Most people, sure. they, try and, they try and squeeze under the radar. That's never the way to go, dude. Never. Never, ever. Especially in college, dude. These teachers, honestly, they don't get talked to enough by students. They and don't. They feel, they feel so important. It's like out of a place of importance, I think, when you talk to them and you actually sincerely want to get knowledge from them. And you know that they have the ability to mess with your grades, adjust the, your grades oh, however. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you not talking to them? And it doesn't take much, yeah. you know? I mean, it's just a little bit of effort here and there, like yeah. after a class or before a class, just walk up and say, hey, how you doing? Just, uh, start a little conversation with yes. them. And I get it. It's so, In today's society, nobody wants to do that. Yeah, it's so Cause, intimidating. Because everybody is, like, glued to a screen nowadays, like, People uh, around our age are a little bit younger. Like they grew up with uh, enabled by screens, so they think they can say whatever they want. But when as soon as they sit them down face to face, they just freeze. Yeah. Right. So, but it, it doesn't take much with these college professors because barely anybody actually even talks in class. Yeah. Right. Not have y'all have y'all run into that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I in in a lot of my classes. So I'll sit in the front because I don't like to be near the back. Naturally. I don't like to be distracted by other people in front of me. I want me and the professor only. And there are a lot of classes I'm in where after the first week, if uh, attendance isn't mandatory and isn't uh, checked, right. half the class or more is gone. And so at that point, it's just a dialogue between me and the professor, and I can learn whatever I need to learn. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Sit in the front. That's the number one tip I'll give you is sit in the front. Keys. And number two is if you don't understand something, stop the professor and get him to explain it to you. Because and oh. also, if he has any questions, try and be the one to answer. Because if you answer wrong, he'll be able to think about your thought process and explain it in a way that you'll understand it. Mm. And it might not be anybody else in that room that understands it, but you understand it because you answered it wrong and he can understand where your thought process went Dude, and how to yeah. fix your thought process. And it comes back and pays dividends because you get that ROI, that return on investment yes. on the exams. Yeah, Espe of course. Right. Especially if there are any open-ended questions. That If you have a good relationship with the professor during court, the class time and you're talking to him, you're asking questions and you're actually participating, they are way more likely to give you a lot more partial credit yeah. if you miss something on an exam and because they understand, oh, I know who this is. He knows it. They know the information. Yeah. They just may have skipped a step yeah. or gotten a calculation wrong or something like that, but they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I have a perfect right. example of this exact thing. In this last class I took, one of the classes I took last semester called Data Structures, in the class I asked a question, and there's this uh, different algorithm. So have you ever heard of a hash function? I, no. Okay, so a hash function, long and the short of it is, it's basically a way of taking data and putting it into a table. 
okay? Gotcha. And uh, this function, you put in, like, a key to it, and it outputs some number or, like, a location, basically. Okay. And uh, there's multiple ways you can do that. You can do linear probing where yeah, the location, if there's a collision at the location, there's already data there. You can't insert data. It'll go down to the next slot, the next available slot. And just keep working and its way yeah, down? So that's linear probing. Then there's quadratic where it's like it'll go down uh, one spot, or it'll go down zero spots, then one spot, then three spots, then s nine spots. I don't I don't remember the, the pattern. Testing that knowledge real quick, aren't we, right here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't remember the pattern exactly, but um, it's not linear probing. It's called quadratic, quadratic probing because it's like one to the second, two to the second, three to the second, and okay. so on and so forth. Um, and then there's another method called double hashing. And I was confused one day in class. I was like, so can you use quadratic probing and then double hashing? And he said, no, these are, these are two different ways of doing it. Then on the test, he said, use quadratic probing and these hash functions. And there was two hash functions. <coughs> And I was like, this is literally the question that I asked in class. Right. And he's trying to trick the people that weren't paying attention. Oh, I hate trick questions and on exams. Oh, yeah, he loves them. He loves them, dude. He had, no. he had all his that. questions were trick questions. Really? <laughs> Not oh, really, well, actually, he would he would make it smart enough to where like a lot of them were straightforward, and then he would sneak in a couple here and there just Ooh. to get people off. Yeah, so me, like... I felt like that one was just. I felt like that was literally just tailored toward me, dude. Because he I had singled asked you that out, question. bro. Yeah, he legitimately. singled you out. And he was he like, it. "Dude, I know this. I know this fool is gonna get this one right, and I know that the rest of the class is, is not. gonna get it wrong." Yeah, whoever wasn't <laughs> paying attention, even like the the dude sitting next to me who was in class when I asked that, he even got it wrong. <laughs> so I was like, "Good lord!" I think I was one of the very few that got that question right on the test. Just Man. because of that, because I asked that question. And it pays dividends, it bro. It pays dividends. He he moved the test around, changed the test to where oh, he yeah. would make sure I got a question right. And, you know, that just goes to show you, ask questions. And if you don't understand something, get the professor to explain it to you. Well, that, that, go, that moves on past college, too, man. Because, like, I'm working now, right? So yeah. at my job, like, I, I got a lot of initial responsibility for what, I'm, what I do for a living. Yeah. And, but... The people above me, like the people in charge of me, they are a wealth of knowledge. Yes. But in uh, what I learned when you in from school in college, that if you ask questions when you do not under understand something or know the pro full process, people are more than well happy to help you and, yes. uh, and educate. Yeah, it's and crazy. It all it all goes back to the power dynamic. So people want to feel powerful. And when you tell them by asking a question that they have knowledge that you don't have, oh, it that makes them feel it so makes good. Them feel so good, and especially if they can explain it to you to where you know how to do it after they tell you how to do it, it's oh, like yeah. absolute ego boost because they're like, and they love I, it. I knew more than them, and now I was able to help them no more. They love it, dude. Oh, there is such. I, I will say, even for myself, I've run into this when I'm educating some people sometimes, yeah. right? There's that gratification that you get inside mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, man, I'm educating somebody on some real shit yeah. right yes. now. Yeah. And it, just, it feels so good. You get that bubbly feeling inside in a good way. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, man, I feel important. Yeah. Like, I feel like I know shit now. Yeah. But it's also nice, like, being at college and you just got all these teachers who you can just extract all their knowledge from and then yes. just co combine it all it's yeah wonderful and most people aren't taking oh, yeah. advantage of that they're just sitting in the seat or whatever comes across their their eyes they're like okay yeah, yeah, yeah. they're not even thinking you want to know the people i hated the most whenever i was in a college lecture what the <laughs> that would be asleep <laughs> i haven't even seen that for what? real I've seen it yes I've seen it no yes. way i'm like i mean first off it's pretty common I, i'm such i'm such an analytically minded and think person and thinker so i'm like i'm here for a reason right yeah. right i like i'm paying money to go to this pl this university to learn something and like i i planned my entire college career because it was like i knew i wanted to get a good job with a good degree like i didn't want to get some like bogus degree that ain't going to get you any any type of good job right yeah. so like I, that's my mindset so when i was in the lecture like i'm here to learn this shit like i'm paying attention i'm writing my note copious amounts of notes and everything and then I, if I look over to my left and I see some <laughs> just sleeping in his chair, 
And what then the professor's not going to do anything, right? No. Right? Because but he, I'm j- he doesn't have time to exactly. stop the class. That's right. not their job. Yeah, yeah. Right. But I'm just like, what are you? Why are you here? Yeah. Like yeah. nowadays, I just feel like college is an excuse. And in my personal opinion, the education system, like I'm sure we've all heard stories from our parents or from older uh, family members or people that we know that went through the education system back in like the 70s, 80s, or even earlier, where it was like so much more stringent, right? Yeah. It was so much more uh, um, academically rigorous yeah. on everybody. And now I feel like the education system is just so far laxed and just so like gone down the wayside in a lot of ways. Yeah. And now I will say there are certain areas within the education system, like STEM specifically. <laughs> they don't they don't have any space to be lax. They right. cannot. Right. When you're a doctor when you're going to be a doctor, <laughs> you need to have that knowledge no matter what. Yeah. Right. Where so I'm just like when I see people sleeping in class, I'm like, are you hung over? Were you drinking too much? Are you high? Like, what's going on? Why aren't you paying attention? <laughs> You're the feds on them. You're the feds. <laughs> I'm, a nar- I'm a secret narc in, that, <laughs> yeah. in the classroom, bro. Are you drunk? Are you high? What's going on? Just hold on, yeah. hold on. I need you to piss in this cup, uh, yeah, and here's yeah, a breathalyzer, yeah. sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, wake up, wake up, wake up. Where you at? What hey, are you doing? piss in this cup and come back. <laughs> <laughs> Drop your drawers in the corner over here, man. <laughs> We're gonna do this like the NFL. I gotta see everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh, oh but I mean, you like beds in the class. <laughs> like when you're yeah, out of the classroom, like yeah, you can have fun. I get that. Yeah. Right. College is about expand, like spreading your wings, learn, uh, gaining new life experiences and stuff right. like that. But at the end of the day, all it is is experience to get you ready for the next step. Yeah. Right. So once you graduate, are mm-hmm. you getting prepared? Are you learning stuff for when you enter in the into the workforce? Yeah, and I right? will say there is some merit and some value in going out on the weekends, learning how to interact with people your age, and things like that. There's some merit in that for sure. Learning how to gain friendships, but what there's no merit in is getting drunk as shit, not remembering what even happened the night before. Dude, I don't understand 100%. what the appeal of blackout drunk is. I don't get it. You can't. I you don't remember. remember. Yeah. What's the point of doing it yeah. if you don't remember it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, it doesn't what? make any sense to Let me. Let me just and, do and a bunch of stuff and then be like, oh, and I don't know what happened. And that was great. You go <laughs> blow a band at like the bars or some shit. Yeah, like that. exactly. And so it's like, what am I doing? Like, one, I don't remember it. Wasting two, money. Two, yeah. my bank account is dry now, oh so God. it's like I'm stuck eating ramen noodles again. Three, yeah, my liver's shot. Oh no! Oh my gosh! And yeah. I'm hungover. And it's all these college <laughs> you know, students. Just they're like, <laughs> they have no money to begin with, and then they go spend a hundred dollars. Their tab at the end of the night is a hundred dollars, hundred twenty dollars, at one bar. Oh, yeah. And what do they have to show for it? They don't even remember it. Exactly. They don't it's, even remember racking up that. So I think, yeah, absolutely. Go out and have fun, but don't get drunk as shit. Don't get to the point where you're not going to remember what happened. And then definitely don't go to class and sleep the next day. Absolutely not. Oh, yeah. Get now, to home at a reasonable hour, okay? And on a Sunday, what are you doing? And obviously, as long as you're old enough. Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah. Please, please drink responsibly and obey all, all laws. Yep. Now, I will say, so I moved to Montgomery, right? Yeah. Get, l- switch it up a little bit. So I moved to Montgomery, and in mo- outside Montgomery, there's this, what I like to call redneck top golf. So it's this, ba- <laughs> it's this? A, it's this bar with, that's attached to a driving range. And instead of having, like, you, we've all been to top golf, right? So yeah. you have, like, those targets, and the balls go into the target, and you get points, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this place, instead of having targets, they have, like, old cars. They have a box <laughs> truck at, as their main target. That's so Montgomery, dude. And then they have, like, cable ties. Like, you know the big cable ties, yeah. wooden cable ties? Yeah. They have those as targets, too. And then they have, like, a steel plate target and a steel chicken or turkey you can try and hit. <laughs> so, like, I used to go out there every Thursday night because on Thursday night at this place, the balls were free to hit. So what I would do is I would go out to this place, start a tab, get a silver bullet or a Coors, a Coors Light, right? Go out there, with grab a bucket of balls, and start hitting balls. And I got pretty good because I was going out every week. And then I started hustling. I started hustling people because that, that big box truck's at like about 100 yards. So I got to the point where I, I could hit that thing about 9 out of 10 times. Yeah. And then I would wait until some – Tipsy people came out with, and they were came out with their uh, random ass clubs you can get from inside to mm-hmm. come and hit hit their balls, 
And then when they start coming out, I start shanking it, right? I start Dang. shaking it. I start duck cooking it, slicing it oh, no. all over the place. And then I'm like, hey, y'all want to play a game? And they're like, hey, what you got? What you got? And I'm like, uh, first person to hit the truck buys the other person a beer. Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> I'd still be shanking it or I'd be hitting it thin or fat, not not really give it, trying, right? Mm-hmm. And then as soon as uh, two, one or two of them got close, I'd be like, okay, I don't want to lose any money. So then I hit it on my next shot or my next two shots, <clears throat> and I was like, oh, well, y'all owe me a beer, double or nothing, or you want to play for cash? Oh. oh. And then yeah. they're like, oh, let's play for some cash. Let's play for some cash. So when you first start out and you're like, all right, let's play for a beer, well, beers are like three, two seventy-five to four bucks, right? Depending wow. on which beer you get. That's pretty yeah. cheap, right? So I'm just like, ah, oh, cost of beer is nothing really, because you're yeah. just paying the guy that hits it. You're yeah, just paying yeah. for his. And then, but once you start throwing some money in there, and they're like, I'll play you for twenty. I'll pay. Oh. And the first one to hit it, uh, two times, twenty bucks. Wow. Or, okay. For each hit you get, it's ten dollars, and you just start racking it up. So then. I let them hit it maybe once or twice, and then I just get dialed in, right? So yes. I start right. hitting it like six out of eight, six out of ten times, something like that. And by the end of the night, I'm coming out with like 40, 60 bucks in my pocket, green money cash. Green money cash. Green money cash. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm just taking that. And I then, love that. And then at the end of the night, my tab is like 10 bucks. Oh. Oh my right? gosh! And then, yeah. uh, and then obviously, be nice to your servers and your bartenders. Leave them a good tip. Yeah. So I, I just throw another an extra five on top of the ten as a tip. That's a pretty nice tip. That's a fifty yeah. percent tip right That's there. That's a great tip. Like, if any of y'all have worked in the service industry, which I know a couple of y'all have, like g- receiving a fifty dollar tip on anything is fucking nice, right? Like, I mean, man, I'll take that. So, but now once you start doing that, you start the bartenders start to know who you are. Mm-hmm. They treat you better. And again, it goes back to that long-term R return on investment, right? right. So it's like if you treat somebody th- uh, uh, in a good way, <coughs> odds are you're going to get treated back the same way. Yeah. So it just pays dividends in the long run, which a lot of people nowadays just don't understand. Yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of. Yeah. But hey, little working that little side hustle, making a little extra spending money or gas money here yeah. and there, that was real fun. Um, I, and then I hustled a. I went. I played in a scramble turn, a uh, scramble golf tournament. So I like to mm-hmm. play golf. If you haven't picked up on that yet, <laughs> um, but I mean, when you're born in Augusta, Georgia, right? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. wearing a. Ma- I got a Masters polo Masters and a Masters shirt. hat on, so I got to represent. But um, so I went and played in a uh, four man scramble tournament for work, Up down work. in uh, Tampa, outside Tampa, Florida, in Clearwater. Oh, right. So, Traveling. oh, it was, all, hey, man, that was the first time I hopped on a plane in, like, two and a half, three years before yeah. COVID, so that was pretty fun, not going to lie. Nice. But uh, get down there, and initially, I'm, like, scoping out the competition, right? I mean, we're all, everybody's at the range, warming up, so I'm I'm doing this, I'm I'm in my hustle mode. Right. Right, <laughs> so I, I'm not hitting them real good, yep. like, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Hitting left, hitting right. Yeah, yeah right, <laughs> so I'm just, like, shanking it over this way or duck hooking it to the left, things right. of that nature. And then once we start playing, though, I'm just like, okay, hold on. The guy, the two other guys in our group, we're looking at them at poten- as potential clients for our, for our business. Mm-hmm. Because I'm playing with the owner of the company. It's me and her and then two potential clients in our foursome. Mm. So I'm like, I told her ahead of time, I was like, all right, here's the deal. After a couple holes, let's make a bet with them. If we play my ball, because it's best ball scramble, right? Mm-hmm. If we play my ball the whole, whole in the entire hole, we get them to sign our contract as clients. <laughs> well, guess, what a gamble. Guess what happened? You want to know? We won the hole. <laughs> we got second place in the tournament. We ended up having both of them as clients now. Let's Incredible. go. <laughs> yeah. Big awesome. money moves. Yeah, that, the, ROI, the ROI on that <laughs> trip for us is over 3,000%. Good oh lord. Well worth the investment, yeah, right? That's insane. And you got to go on a trip. I know. I got to play golf for work. You got I got to play golf for work. I love it, man. <laughs> it's incredible. And, and because of that, because after we got second place, I also won the, the long drive contest for the guys there. Yeah. Nice. 324 or 325 yards. Piped it down the middle. Beautiful. Uh, we won't talk about the tailwind that it had helping me. But <gasps> shh, shh, keep that on the down. <laughs> but um, because of that, we, uh, we posted that on social media, right? Mm-hmm. And then in three weeks... Me and the owner of the company, we got invited to another scramble tournament where there's big money for the winners. 
Oh. Like, there's a massive pot, like a <laughs> massive purse if we win. Wow. So now, but now I'm like, oh shoot! Everybody knows I can play in this in this industry, though. Oh, now you can't act it. So yeah. I, I like, am I gonna, still gonna be able to hustle? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. Maybe but, not all of them, though. I, yeah, that's the thing. It's not like, everyone. Though. Now, if I can hustle at least one and get the ROI back. Yep, there you go. And, and all I it call, takes is one. All it takes is one. We can get that win-win situation ra- rocking yes. and rolling. <laughs> that's incredible. You were at an actual hustler. Hey, shrewd businessman, man. Shrewd, shrewd negotiator. I love that, dude. You, you got to do what you got to do, wow. man. Wow. Make that money. Yeah. Dude, it is so good having you back in town, dude. Man, I love it's being back. It's been far too long. It has. It has. I got to come up and see you in Montgomery sometime. Or, uh, see you in um, Birmingham? No, I'm in Montgomery. Yeah. So you're Mo- back in uh, Montgomery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm living in Montgomery. Um, Bought a house there. I like it. B- house was built in 1915, by the way. <laughs> It doesn't even look old though. From I know. from a snaps I see, wow. Right. So, no, but if you do come, you gotta be careful. You gotta share everything with my two dogs. So. Oh yeah, I don't mind that. All right, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. I got uh, so I got uh, two dogs. One is a purebred jet black Belgian Malinois. What is that? So those are the uh, like military and cop police dogs. Oh, like those those guys. That's a drug sniffing dog. Oh boy, that <laughs> that dog like. <laughs> he that, said, "Oh boy." <laughs> I I got a funny story though. So oh. I take that like so I work I'm working fr- primarily from home, but if I'm hungry, I'll throw the do- I'll throw them in the back of my car, and I'll mm-hmm. go get some food through a drive through. And there's this McDonald's near my house back in Montgomery where I drove through the drive through, and I have my dog in the back seat with the window down. And I bought him like this tactical vest, <gasps> right? And he's got a few patches on it and everything. But his head he sticks his head and like his whole like whole neck out the window. So when I roll up to pay, the lady is like, Oh my god, no, that dog is huge, he's gonna kill me. <laughs> and then I'm like, Nah, he's all right. He's a retired police case, military working dog, da 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 da. And she's like, oh, well, what, what what, did he do? And I was like, oh, he was a drug-sniffing dog. And then as soon as I said that, she slams that window closed. <laughs> and then he sat, he sat down, which is like what That's most uh, drug dogs do to alert. Yeah. He, he like sat down, his ears perked up. And then, I'll, and then she was like, when she ha- came back to give me my card, she like opened it, just she just cracked it, and then stuck her arm out with the card in the receipt, like here you go, here you go, next window, and then just shut it real quick. <laughs> and I'm just like, That's That's so. Funny. What do you think I'm gonna do? Yeah. I'm not gonna do shit. I, like I don't have any. Power. I'm calling the cops right now. My dog just alerted at the, <laughs> the dog I'm I have a retired police through. dog, and it just alerted to this lady <laughs> at the drive-thru. <laughs> like, Send her, an officer. That's so her funny. face went straight red, bro. Like she <laughs> was, she was scared. Like I, I, was she dealing? I don't know. Was she dealing out of the McDonald's drive-thru window? Out the window? McDonald's drive-thru. I imagine that, dude. She probably thought you were undercover or something. Possibly. Oh. That's Although, so funny. That's some shit I would expect at a Waffle House, not a McDonald's. Yeah, Let's be honest. True. Let's be honest. But also, that's crazy as hell too, because. That's like just telling them you've got drugs in that. Exactly. You know, you slam that thing close. Maybe she's allergic to dogs. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe she's just really scared of dogs, dude. She's just terrified of them. Maybe. I mean, he is a big boy. I'm not going to lie. He's like he's 94 pounds. Good lord. Yeah, he he's he's a big old guy. <laughs> and like he's wow. so he's jet black too, right? So yeah. if it's dark outside and oh. there's no moon, you can hear him, but you cannot see him. Demon dog. He he's just a shadow. It's wow. like where is he? But it is creepy sometimes. Like I'll be in the backyard and ha- he'll just be out roaming in the back, and then there's no light out. Yeah. And I'm like, where did he go? Like I hear him, but like where is he? Can <laughs> That's you? Im- wild. But could you imagine like if you're like a bad guy and like with this type of dog and you try and break into my house? And then it's it's pitch black, and then you just all of a sudden just hear like this oh. growling and snar- snarling from this oh dog. Oh my god! But you can't see it. I I jump out a window immediately. Yeah. Is that what do you think is more effective, that or racking a shotgun? What to to get that dog both. to stop? No, to get get a burglar out of your house. I'd say both. Uh, no, the dog. Yeah. The dog has no boundaries, dude. The dog's oh, gonna man. tear your ass apart, dude. Yeah, he won't stop. I might, yeah. I might not press the trigger, but the dog is gonna tear your ass apart. That's just the bottom line. The the number one protection you can have is a dog. Oh yeah, I mean, have you have you seen online like those uh, so on social media where it's like 
girls are like, oh, I have my big dog privilege, so I can walk at walk alone at night. Have you seen any of those? No. Yeah, so it's like girl, like these uh, young women, um, and normally would be a fr- quote afraid to be walking around outside at night. Yeah. Or on the street, but like they have like a Cane Corso, which is like 170 pounds, <laughs> or a Belgian Malamar, or German Shepherd, or Doberman, and they're like, all right, I got my big dog privilege. Come at me. Yeah, facts. <laughs> yeah, because anybody that comes after them, they're just arr, 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 arr. exactly. They're gonna tear their ass apart. They're just <laughs> meat missiles, bro. Dude, yeah, and one hundred and ten percent. Those are the type of dogs that'll grab you, and they will not let go, dude. No, they won't. They will not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I might like miss my shot. They're not gonna miss. They're gonna come up. They're gonna grab you by the balls and drag your ass around. <laughs> that would hurt <laughs> yes. so bad. I know, dude. They're gonna they're gonna dug on chew off your dick. Oh, <laughs> There's no. nothing you can do about oh. that. There's nothing you can do oh. about that, dude. And on that note, I think we're coming up on an hour. Are we? Already? That's There's no way. Uh, James? James, what does it say on this camera? Can you tell? Man, we, we just went along, didn't we, boys? I know, dude. Oh, I wow. love this. I love this, too. Man, or is it an hour of... Every time... We got we to gotta make this regular. Like, every time I get back we to, gotta make a podcast to the AUAG, to check in. we got to get a podcast okay. going. What are we at? We are at... F- yeah. How much? Oh, yeah. So we've got another yeah. 10, 15. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So big dog privilege is a funny thing, dude. It's real, though, It man. is very much real. It is. Yeah. And, you know, my uh, my cousin was a sniper. And yeah. you remember Claude. Oh, Claude. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah. So he was a sniper, and he said the, the number one thing that he hated when a target had a dog. Yeah. Because he would have to shoot the dog before he shot the person. Because mm. otherwise, the dog is going to tell everyone he's there. Right. You know, the dog is probably going to know exactly where the bullet came from. They've got incredible hearing. Mm-hmm. And they're probably going to run toward him. And everyone's going to know uh, that the person is shot if the dog starts howling. Right. You know, right. or the dog yep. starts running toward the person that just shot their owner. You know, so he said he would always hate when his target had a dog. And so that's just I, I heard that I said, hey, if I'm having if I have a dog, I'm going to make myself a harder target for one of the hi- most highly trained killers in the world. Basically. Pretty much. Yeah. All of the world. Yeah. But at least all of the American military. Right. And I mean, it's a cheap thing to do, too. Right. Like buy a dog, bond with the dog. And then that's yours. Right. Yeah. Like when you bond with the dog, there's nothing that will break that bond. That's till death do us part for real, dude. Yeah, like th- that you dog <laughs> can't divorce your ass. <laughs> that dog cannot divorce your ass. And there's so many stories of owners that like they take their dog, like they can't, they can't have their dog anymore. They can't pay for it or whatever. So they take their dog to a, a shelter or something. Their dog breaks out of the shelter, runs like 20 miles and to come find them. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many stories like that, dude. Or what's that famous one? Uh, I think it's uh, Hachiko. I think, I think that's in Japan. James, you might have to uh, verify that. But um, it's uh, so it's the story of this dog that its owner passed away on a train. Like it would, its owner would take a train to another city to work. Yeah. And one day the the owner died at work and didn't come back on the train. And this dog, like for years, would always just sit and wait at that train station waiting for the owner to return and i think they create they built a statue of the dog at the train station wow based on its like um devotion for its owner yeah dude dogs are great yeah that's uh, yeah they built a statue because the dog waited at the station every day for nearly 10 years 10 Good years lord talk about devotion to your owner yeah, man yeah dude that's a real dog right there and that's they also, a real dog um cremated the dog and buried the dog with its owner when they when he died wow that's crazy that's awesome dogs yeah. are different man i love dogs there's man. a reason they're called man's best friend right absolutely yeah it's cuz we bred them to be that exactly that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. I tell that's you right. what. I tell you what. So that's, right. that's, that's right. the one dog. Right. What about the other dog you have? So the uh, my other dog, it's a miniature Dutch Shepherd pit mix. Oh wow! Now when I say miniature, it's it's like forty pounds. She's like forty <laughs> pounds. <laughs> Good lord! But it's not a full grown pit, which most pits are get up to what like. 70, 80 pounds. Yeah, Higgins. And then a Dutch Shepherd is an offshoot of a Belgian Malamal and a German Shepherd. Yeah. 
right? And those get to about 70 to 90 pounds. So this one, she just lost the genetic lottery out of both <laughs> out of both breeds. <laughs> wow. So she's like, uh, I'm only gonna stay about 40 pounds, and but she is so cute, and but she's the crackhead out of the two. Oh like, yeah, she is a she is the energizer or pinball. Like she will not sit it's, still. It's always <laughs> it's always the one the smaller though. It is. It's always the small ones who just have to bounce off the walls. The funniest story since I've been in Montgomery about dogs though. So I was a property manager in Montgomery for about a year or so. Yeah. And I had to go to this house to do a lot a uh, lock change. So change out all the locks of the house. Mhm. We were, we were given the house and we were told by the cl- the owner of the property that it was vacant. So we were like, "All right, cool. So I'm just going to drive up with my locksmith. We're going to pop the locks off. We're going to change the locks. Should take about 10 to 15 minutes." Yeah. We had this down to a science. Like we were doing it so much. Well, I pull up and there, excuse me, there's a car under the carport of this property. There's little garden gnomes by the front door, and like there's children art, children's artwork in the windows. And I'm like, oh no, this isn't a vacant property. Like wow. this, this is gonna, this messes everything up. Yeah. yeah. So then my, and I park on the street. So my locksmith comes about a minute later, and he parks, in, he he pulls his van into the driveway. Yeah. Well, I told him, all right, well, don't do anything because it's clearly occupied. I'm just going to write him a note, leave the note, and tell him we're your new property managers, contact our office, bring any type of paperwork or anything you have about being in the property to the office, and we'll get it all sorted and figure it out. Yeah. Right. Well, not like two seconds after I put this note in the door, this little Kia Fiat or Kia Rio or Ford Fiesta, one of these things, comes screaming down at like 70 miles an hour down this road and then hits the brakes and there's skin marks on this on the street now. Like Good dead, Lord. dead 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 ass. This old obese white woman that's like five foot four, easily over three hundred and sixty pounds. <laughs> <laughs> like Good Lord. Like built like the Pillsbury Doughboy, right? <laughs> Hops out of this car. And starts yelling bloody mur, screaming bloody murder about us. Like you can't touch my locks. I live here. Da 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 da. All this. My child's inside. Yada yada yada. My God. So then I said, "Ma'am, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We didn't touch your locks. There's a note on the door. Contact the office. We'll get it all sorted. And then we're gonna go. We're just gonna leave. Like we, that's a that's an issue for another day, right? Yeah. So I started heading to my car, and then my the locksmith opens this van door, and then this lady proceeds to chase my locksmith like two laps around his van, and then she just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Even when, he, when it's very clear, he's trying to leave. Right. What so in the world? It gets better. She runs to her front door, unlocks it, and when I went and put that note on the door, there's a doormat that said, Beware, entering the Chihuahua's lair. <gasps> oh, no. So she opens the door. And then this chihuahua just bolts out the uh, front door. I didn't notice it at the time, but it had like a lead, like one of those wire leads, like that lo- those long wires yeah, that yeah. you can attach to your dog. Mm-hmm. I didn't notice at the time, and it made a beeline for me. And like I re, I, I mean, I played a little bit of soccer back back in the day. <laughs> Not, it's been a while though. So I was like, shit, that thing comes at me. I'm kicking that thing to Bir- I'm drop kicking that thing to Birmingham. Yes. I don't care. <laughs> so I rear my leg back, and then right as it's about to get to me. It reaches the end of its tether, uh-huh. and then it just, like, the whole thing goes air, the whole thing just jumps in the air and just, like, flies Snaps back. back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it just, like, <laughs> just, like, somebody oh yanking you. God. Like, we've all seen those, like, Wiley e. Coyote uh, cartoons <laughs> where it's, like, just gets <laughs> yes. yanked. Yeah, that's what happened. And then the lady grabs, like, some piece of metal from inside her house oh my God. or inside the property. And I'm like, nope, I'm gone. I just run to my car Dang. on the street, and then I just floor it out of there. She came busting 70 in. I went zero to 60 as fast as my car would take me out of there. <laughs> and then my locksmith, he's just hot. He gets in his car in his van, and he hightails it out of there too. And, and then we just we're just talking about it for like the next three months, talking about that crazy chihuahua what lady. A crackhead. <laughs> why that would she wild. do that? For real, I don't know. You man. have no clue to this day why she did that. Oh no! Did she ever come into the office and give you the documents? What happened with that situation? How did it resolve? Never hurt. Okay, so I didn't hear from her. My assistant property manager said she called. 
And over the phone, she said, well, I have a lease for the property, yada, 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 right? Yeah. I have all the documentation. So my assistant property manager, under my directive, I told her to tell the lady, bring all the hard copies into the office. Yeah. Let us scan it and make copies for our, our own records, and we'll, we'll figure out where to go from there. She never One, she never came to the office, so we communicated with the owner and with um, Alabama uh, real estate law, landlord-tenant law. If there's no lease in place, because it's, it's not like California, you don't get squatter's rights. Really? Alabama doesn't have squatter's rights? Well, it takes a long time for them to develop. Like a year? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same thing with Texas. Texas is a year, I think. Right. So, Alab- uh, well, like unlike California, where California is like a week. No way. Yeah, it's so it's short. It's pretty quick. It, it is so short. I don't know the expe- specific I law. I know what I'm doing this weekend. Yeah, fly out <laughs> to California, find a mansion, and just squat in the mansion. Yes. Now it's yours. Yeah. But um, That's crazy. So, basically, we ended up having to um, evict her. And the eviction process took, at this time, took forever because the uh, um, CDC moratorium had just gotten lifted. So there was all this, like, uh, backfill that had to happen. Oh, yeah. Like, it was so bad. The process was so backed up. The courts were so uh, backed up and so full. Well, and this is Uncle Sam trying to squeeze or government trying to squeeze every dollar they can. They offered that you can pay an accelerated amount of money. To expedite it, what? the process. What? That's yeah. ridiculous. Right. That's ridiculous. They'll just move you up the stack if you Basically. if you pay more money. Hey, wow. It's pay to play. I hate that. Pay to play all day. <sighs> That's horrible. So, eventually, we went we f- we went through this process, and right before we're about to do what's called a sit out, so the county sheriff comes out, um, and then you have to have some people t- that are on standby to remove any type of personal property and put it on the street. Yeah. Right? So we're about to do that. And then the owner of the property calls and he's like, I haven't gotten I haven't made any money from this property since it's been under your management. I was like, Oh, that's not our fault. We're Facts. We, we're following the protocol, we're following our stand, our SOP or standard operating procedure to resolve this issue. But it takes time. And he's like, I'm done with y'all. Click. No way. After you had gone through months of all, work, yes. all the legwork for him. All of it. He just. Oh, he's, my he's like, gosh. He's like, I'm done with you. What? <laughs> what a dummy. Right. So oh. now I have to wait for his new property management company to reach out to me. Oh, my God. Now, technically, I still had a <laughs> fiduciary responsibility to that owner. So I have to put his interests above mine. Yeah. That's what fiduciary means, if y'all didn't know. So I had to walk the new property manager through the entire process. They get all the documentation, everything. But what he didn't didn't know is because he changed property managers and we were the one that started the legal proceedings, he had to restart it with the new property manager. <gasps> no. You, c- you couldn't just ass- transfer it. You can't transfer those legal documents because it's my property management company's name on it, not the new one. So he had to go through that entire process again. He ended up ha- probably having to wait another four months. That's what he gets. That is what he gets. That's what he gets. And he couldn't wait another two weeks. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah. The more you fuck around, the more you're gonna find out. That's right? exactly and right. And yeah. that's He's what that's pretty what high happened. on that graph. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was, he he went to that that nine out of nine or that ten out of ten yeah, on yeah. that graph. Oh man, he went far too high. Exactly. He flew too close to the sun. Just needless. like Icarus. Yes. N- needless to say, he found out. He did. He yes. did. <laughs> well, more or less, his pocketbook found out because yeah. he wasn't making any money off of that. And he investment. was having to pay two different companies too, because yeah. he paid y'all for the time you worked with him, and then he had to go turn around and pay the other company for yep. the next four months while they were doing exactly what y'all had done. Exactly. Yeah. That's horrible. What a dumbass. Bad yeah. money management. Bad business management decision right there. Yeah. And that that's ridiculous. Also, that sucks for y'all, too, because y'all didn't have the opportunity to continue making money off their property. Exactly. After yeah. you had already done all the legwork. Like, after that, you would have to do very little. You would right. It would just be maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. After, well, so property management is a very, in, there's a lot of a- aspects to it. Yeah. Right. So it's a very complicated industry. 
there's a reason why there are things called there are people called professional property managers because when most real estate investors or most people think property management it's like oh picking up a rent check that's it right yeah. there's so much more to it there's yeah. ma- there's maintenance there's leasing there's renovations or turns that you have to do what are turns uh, so turns is what happens when one tenant vacates and before we can put that property back on the market we have to turn the property. We have to repair anything that was damaged while the previous tenant yeah. was in there, make any type of upgrades the owner might want to make while there's nobody in the property yeah. to make sure it's a uh, turn. I mean, and you've heard the term turnkey, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's what we're doing. We're making the property turnkey or just shorten it to turning the property. Yeah, basically it getting it to the point where these people are going to move into like a brand new rental. Exactly, yeah. right. So, and that's a complex process in of itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there, there are places where the paint's chipped. You got to go redo that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, everything. There's so many things that go into turning a property, I'm sure. And that's when you run into a lot of slumlords, right? Slumlords. We've heard the term, right? Mm-hmm. So, it's where slumlords are like, uh, These are property owners that don't care. Right. They don't want to <laughs> put the money into fixing the property to <laughs> get top dollar or get the best tenant. It just it, sounds cool, though. At the, Slumlord. At the end of the day, the way you make the most money in real estate investing is being able to put the best quality tenant in the property. Yeah. And that's why they want I mean, a good family. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you this. The best tenants, typically, are military. Military. Really? Yes. Why is that? Because right, well, it's going to be organized. For, that's, that's number one. Most military families are very put together and organized. Yeah. But on top of that, they get their housing allowance. Oh. If, if it's a family. And you know they're going to pay. Exactly. If it's a family, you know they're going to get a housing allowance. And they so, can't spend that on anything but housing, correct? Correct. Yeah, so, like, so they have insured income for that house. Exactly. And so you have insured income from them. From them, yeah. yeah. Oh. And, oh. Yeah. 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 Little tricks of the trade, How right? How about that? That makes perfect sense. And so it's, uh, that's why I love dealing with military families. Now, we do because military is the military. We do have caveats within the leases, right. so you can get new orders to new areas at the drop of a hat when you're in the yeah. military. So you have to be able to roll, tenant, pull yeah. out of that lease at right. any point in time. We make sure that we are able to do that and communicate with the these military tenants by if they provide us with their new orders, mm-hmm. we will automatically get them out. It automatically will get them out of the lease yeah. at no penalty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, at the end of the That's day... That's the way it has to work. Yeah. Right. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, these are the people that are willing to, like, l- l- put their lives on the line, lay it down yeah. for us to protect yeah. what we have here. Yeah. You want to give them everything you can. least it, we can do yeah. is let them out of a lease a little early. Right. With, yeah. no, with no additional penalty. Right. Because not saying, yeah. now pay us $500 out of your pocket. Right. Well, I always thought that that was, um, like, the law provided... Um, so, I don't, I don't know how to put it, but basically, like... The law assures that any leasing company has to get them out of the lease early if they are deployed or if they're moving. Yes. That mm-hmm. is correct. Right. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's a fair housing law. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. So it's not necessarily just your company. It's like across the board. If you are right. a property management company, you have to make sure these military people can get out of the lease now at there any is, point in time. Now, there are some caveats to that, though. What's that? So if you are what's known called self-managing, and if it's your only rental property— Fair housing law does not apply to you. Mm. You can put whatever parameters you want on who's going to occupy that unit. Every military person, listen to this. So if it's a self man- self managed single and it's their only real estate investment property, yeah, they can put whatever terms they want on. Exactly, they are okay. not obligated to follow fair housing law. Wow, it the, it it can get really um, sketchy and really slumlordy that way because fair housing law partakes protects race religion gender every, and um if and uh disabilities okay right so professional property management firms operate under fair housing law mm-hmm. now if you so here's a perfect example if you have two properties that are identical and one is managed by a professional property management firm and the other one is managed by a, se- a self-managed owner and that's their only rental property us, we can't deny anybody off of their race, cu- uh, race, religion, gender, or disability. Yeah, that guy, if 
in this example, that person mm-hmm. that owns the other property, he can say, I only want white men between the ages of 25 and 30 with a minimum income of $100,000 a year. And they have to be Muslim. Of any, Yeah. If they don't fit <laughs> that, he can deny their application. But if we do that, we can get sued. We pay massive fines because we have to abide by fair housing law. Wow. The only way that we can deny someone is either by their credit score mm-hmm. or their income level or their if they have um, don't meet the background requirements. So wow. if they had an eviction within the last seven to ten years, we can deny their application on that. Or if they've had been arrested for any major felonies, um, we can deny their application off that. Wow. So you your hands are pretty pretty tied. Yeah, from a legal perspective, yeah. Dude, that's scary, actually, because that means you anybody with, like, you know, anybody that's just going to come in and ruin your property can just get a hold of your property. Yeah, that's why— That's scary. That's why one of the most important things in property management is the tenants or the application screening process. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, like I said, the the way that you make the most money in real estate investing is having the best quality tenant. Yeah. So you want to make sure that your property management firm that you're utilizing— it has the best tenant screening softwares, systems, and processes out there. Because if you can guarantee a high-quality tenant, because more often than not, that high-quality tenant is going to want to renew. Oh, yeah. And if that person wants to renew, and if that person treats that place as a home, not just a place to live, yeah, the, the condition of your property whenever they eventually leave is going to be so much better to then if you just get it somebody that just ha- needs a place to live. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it for me, it's so logical. But yeah. for a lot of people, that a lot of owners that I dealt with, that just didn't click for them. They just want anybody in there. Yeah, they just want a body. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to put a body in there. I have these re- these require- this credit requirement, this income requirement, these, backgro- these uh, background requirements. And if they don't fit that, I'm not going to put anybody. I'm not going to put a, in the person into this property. Yeah. And then they're just like, I need cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Stupid man. That's yeah. not how you make money. Not at all. You make money off appreciation value. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. That's a horrible mindset to have. It really is, which be- goes into why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Um, I'm taking that experience and that expertise I learned in property management, and now I I'm a consultant. Yeah. So I'm a property management and real estate investing consultant. Uh, so you talk to people that are real estate investors. Right. So I talk with real estate investors and owners and operators of property management firms that don't know this sh- this stuff. Okay. That don't, that either don't realize that the property management industry has evolved and grown so much over the last five to ten mm-hmm. years. Yeah. They're still filing leases on paper. Yeah. Which... <laughs> n- is stupid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's good to have a paper backup in case, but digital is the way to go. Yeah. There's so many softwares. Like, you can take, w- there's one software that will take every aspect of managing a property and do all of it for you online, automa- and you can pretty much automate uh, almost every aspect of it. Good Damn. Lord. <laughs> Would you rather, do you think you'd be more efficient au- with everything automated or having to spend six hours to do one lease in pen and paper? Dude, I really like my ink, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I love my ink. As long as, it, my ink. as long no, as give me the software. <laughs> as long as you're using a Pilot G2.7 pen, exactly. then we yeah, then yeah, we yeah. can be friends. There we, there <laughs> yeah. yeah, dude, yeah, that's ridiculous. And you got to think about like, say, a property manager has like 150 properties they manage. Six oh, yeah. hours per property. That's ridiculous. I mean, I was running a 150 property uh property portfolio by myself for about nine months. Wow. I was doing everything. And I bet you had software. I did have software, but yeah. even with all the software, doing it all by myself. That's a lot of work. It felt like I was drinking out of a fire hose, man. Yeah. <laughs> Baptism yeah. by fire, insert cliche here, that's how I felt. Yeah. I well, mean, that, you had so much going on. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, that and, is wild, dude. And now there's some like new softwares, and um, I don't know if we have time to really get into like the AI part of things and how you we can automate. We got a little bit of time. We can go over it. It doesn't matter. How we can au- How there's so much you can automate now. With AI and certain software. How are you using AI? You in particular. So a big part of what I do now for my job is content creation. Really? Yeah. So we have a lot. We do a lot of content creation for our clients. So our main client is a property management firm 
that reaches out that we reach out to them and say, "Hey, we can offer you this service to either our most common one is what we call Rev Sales." So I work for up I work for a company called Rev Up Mastery. Um, so Rev Sales is one of the services we offer, which is basically we will train you and create a customized way just for your company for you to grow and scale your door count in your within your company. What is a door count? Door count is like how many Just door- no, number of properties you have. Right, right. So okay. that's your door okay. count. So basically it's a sit what we call a 6 to 8 week engagement and within this entire engagement I can't give away too much of the, our secret sauce because <laughs> if right. you want that you got to pay for it. No. Uh, <laughs> and, and secret we, sauce. Oh yes, our and and our IP is important, man. We we protect it and we're worth it. Like you can check our Google reviews. We got nothing but five stars. Wow. I mean, if you want to pull us up, revupmastery.com dot com on Google. We got nothing but five James, star reviews. We gotta see that. <laughs> we got nothing but five stars. I think we got about like fifteen or twenty five star reviews up on our. Wow. Like and that's so your bi- customers love you. We they do because that's the thing is like at the end of the day, they're friends. We end up becoming friends with our clients. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But first and foremost, our job and what you're paying us to do is to coach you and consult you to maximize your growth and maximize your company for what you're looking for. Yeah. What you got for us, James? Uh, Yeah, 13 all five stars. <laughs> all five stars. <laughs> Let's go. I think there's one review in there, James, that um, I think it's from John Harris. Is that over the, in there? Uh, Maybe yeah, there's a John Harris. Yeah, read that review for us real quick. Um, great to ex- great to experience with John, Sam, Maya, and whole Rev Up crew. If you need to go from zero to hero in your sales department and skills, this is the place. Damn straight. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, JJ. Wow. Um, That's a great review. Yeah. So JJ, perfect example. Started a property management company down in Mississippi. Started with five doors under okay. management. Mm-hmm. He just graduated from our engagement about three and a half, four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Let's call it a month. Yeah. I think he's close to 100 now. <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> what? <laughs> That's a lot of That's growth. ridiculous. 20X. That's what we deliver. Oh, my gosh. Those are the numbers. Those are the type of numbers you can expect if you work for uh, work with us or you if you uh, consult with us. That's mind-boggling. And that's just one of the services we offer. We also offer a thing called <laughs> Rev Marketing. So we completely re- we have a couple graphic designers and marketing specialists on our uh, on our team, and they are kick ass, man. Like they are incredible at what they do. And so if you want if you want to up your marketing game, and we focus a lot on SEO, right? Yes. So it's just well, all that's those the game now. Yeah, that SEO. It, it's all those backdoor SEO connections, like those fi- Google five star reviews will generate SEO. Yeah. We have a blog on our website that generates SEO. Um, That's a big one. Our LinkedIn profile uh, generates a lot of SEO, too. Yeah. Just the number of uh, fingers you have out there. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, it, Rev Marketing, we completely will revamp your entire marketing image for your company. Wow. Um, we have uh, or Rev, Rev Branding slash Rev Marketing, kind of the same thing. Yeah. Um, Rev Ops or Rev Operations, that's the one that I'm in charge of as a consultant. So it's basically a full deep dive and revamp of the entire organizational structure of the whole company top to bottom. How you run. Exactly. Wow. Now, I have heard a lot in my career. Now, I'm young for what I do. I'm only 23. I've been doing this for about three years now. I've been in the property management uh, industry for about three years. The majority of people that do this are like old in their mid to late fifties, early sixties, and they're white dudes. <laughs> Dang. Right? Yeah. Can you imagine? Now, obviously, there there's some wordplay. There's some, and you got to be uber professional when you do it. Yeah. But in layman's terms, I'm a 23 year old guy that these 50 year olds, 60 year olds that have been doing this for over a decade are paying me this these co- this copious amounts of money to come in and say. Your entire system is whack. Yeah. Out of order. It does not work. I'm gonna come in. I'm having. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be given carte blanche. Completely redo. What is carte blanche? 
it um i forgot the technical t- t- translation it's in fr- i think it's french but um it's basically i got a cl- i got a blank check or i got free reign yeah. to, to do mm. whatever i need to do okay and i'm going to come in here and i'm totally going to overhaul your entire company top to bottom oh yeah but Whoa. the reason i'm going to do it Ooh. and the outcome is going to be something similar to what jj is going through 20x you want to grow you want to scale big thing that we're talking about is scaling right yeah being able to scale your business in whatever aspect we we deliver that all of our services within our our um our service suite our deliverables we have yet to miss wow and we've been around for two years now or almost two years now (laughs) and we have yet you have an incredible track record we have yet to miss a deliverable wow because first and foremost customer service and making sure that we deliver and work with and make sure that our clients are taken care of is the key yeah at the end of the day that's what we care about we care about our clients because they're they bring us our bread so we if we make them happy we get more money yeah and at the end of the day if we get more money and they're happy they get more money yeah and it's a perpetual snowball effect of positivity and profit it's awesome. That's incredible. Incredible, yeah. Wow. Well, we've been going for a minute. That is awesome. I can't wait to uh, come see you down in Montgomery. Oh, yeah. Y'all gotta you all got to get down here, man. On. Dude, absolutely. I'll, I'll come take, see I'll you. take you to a Biscuits game. We got a do- – Biscuits? Biscuits? Yeah. Uh, my, the wow. double league affiliate for the Tampa Bay Rays is in Montgomery. And wow. They're called the Montgomery Biscuits. <laughs> Their stadium is like SRP Park here in Augusta. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is right on the river. Oh, beautiful. Ooh. Yeah, dude. Well, I can't wait to go down and see you. Yeah, just hit me up, man. Um, is there anything you want to plug real quick before we roll out? Um, you can. Well, if, sure. Go ahead. If anybody, I don't know if anybody that uh, listens to this podcast is a property manager, but uh, hit us up on Google RevUpMastery.com. There's some information there. Read about us or check us out on LinkedIn. Uh, my Instagram it's underscore S J Welsh W E L S H the number five underscore. Throw me a follow. Uh, you can find me on, under Samuel Welsh on uh, LinkedIn, too. Man, I'm just going to plug away, bro. I love that. Yeah, yeah. do everything, what you got to do. Anything, More everything. SEO. More SEO yeah, yeah, all yeah. day. Yeah. SEO, yep. All this is going in the transcript on YouTube. It's just plugging your stuff. Do it. I love That's it. That's incredible. Yeah, and without further ado, go check us out on Instagram at the Minimum Wage Pod. And go ahead and check out our Clips channel at MWB Clips on YouTube. And this has been the Minimum Wage Podcast. Even the, the name is above, above our, our pay grade. grade. Peace. Peace.